let me uh, let me start recording and check if the pen works. All right, cool. <clears throat> so today we will continue on to a concept called precise exception. How many people use exception before or seen exception? Okay. Let's go back. Give me a minute. WebEx kind of crashed on me. All right, can you still hear me? Hello, are you there? Okay, perfect. I'm here. I'm back. Sorry, WebEx. Uh, choose to crash without completely crash. So I cannot launch another instance of WebEx and I dig up to find where my original uh, meaning link is. But yeah, exception like Earth, basically, uh, <clears throat> when you have things like divide by zero. Right? So there's an issue if you have multi cycle execution. And the main issue is. Basically, right, you want your program to execute in the order of your uh, your assembly code. Basically, whatever you write in the assembly code, it should be line by line by line by line because that's what the programmer visible state are. But with multi-cycle execution, you have fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back with the five-stage pipeline, right? If you have 30 stage pipeline, the write back happen at the last stage. So that's where, as a programmer, that's where you see the changes, right? And the ISA over here, it actually demand that you have this sequential semantics. Sequential semantics means that if you look at your program, it should be treated as if everything runs sequentially, line by line by line. So my question is, let's say you have divide by zero. Right? Let's say you have divide by zero. When do we know that we have divide by zero? What stage in the five, yeah, sorry, five stage pipeline that we know that we have divide by zero? Uh, not fetch because when you fetch, you only have the instruction binary. Then decode means that you know what instruction it is. Sometimes you might know it's divided by zero in the decode because the immediate becomes zero. Then you move to execute and you go get the value of the register, right? And it just happened that the denominator becomes zero. So in the execute state, you know that, hey, this is the divide by zero. Execute. My next question, my next question is, what are the other instructions in the pipeline? Let's say this is instruction n. Right? Instruction n cost divide by zero. What would happen to instruction n minus two, n minus one? I guess the instruction n itself, n plus one and n plus two. This is in the write back, right? This is in memory. This is an execute. This is in decode. And this is in the fetch. Right? So this is where exception occurs. What happened to these, these two instructions? And what's supposed to happen with these two instructions? 
So my question first, when exception happens, what, what happens to your program? <coughs> what happens to your program when you have an exception? It would do what? As a programmer, if you see an exception, what do you see when you run a program? It crash, right? So your program crash. And as a programmer, what is the next step that you usually do when you see an exception? Modify the program. Basically, you go and debug what happened, right? What happened to my code? What caused an exception? Which instruction caused an exception? This means that instruction n, instruction n should be visible to the programmer. Right? I should see instruction n visibly that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm running this instruction and it caused the program to crash. When as a programmer, when is the stage that I see instruction n? It needs to finish right back, right? It needs to finish until the right back. I need to see the changes. So what does this mean to n minus 1 and n minus 2? So let's say you have the add. Uh, Double point and surface point. and then another add and then the uh, divide and then subtract and then the multiply and this one caused an exception as a programmer you need to see what happened to the first two ads right it need to finish those two instruction it needs to cause an exception right at the divide instruction. And what should happen to the subtract and multiply? So what should I do with a subtract and multiply? Should I finish it or should I throw it away? Yes, you basically throw it away because uh, divide cause an exception. If you keep finishing the subtract, the state of your register will be wrong, right? You can't debug them because you don't know what happened. You already finished newer instruction, future instruction. So what you need to do is to basically freeze the time, freeze the time for the programmer to see what instruction caused that exception, right? So let me first begin by talking about what the difference between exception and interrupts. Exception are things that are internal to the running thread, is specific to the program you're running. This is handled when you detect it by the process itself, right? You have try cache. Try catch means that, okay, if this, except, uh, if this exception happens, try this. Uh, if this other exception happens, try this. The priority uh, uh, of the OS to handle the exception is based on the process priority, which means that if you have the try catch and you have say uh, UI by zero exception, and that process has low priority, it would be basically run by the OS based on that particular priority to handle that exception. What about interrupts? So what are the examples of some interrupts that we use all the time? Uh, break, right? How do you break a program? You hit something on the keyboard, right? Things that are external to the running thread that you cannot predict as a programmer, things like someone type in on the keyboard. Those are handled 
but uh, when convenient by DOS and priority can vary. Precise exception and also uh, interrupts means that when these things occurs, our previous instructions should be retired and no future instructions should be retired. Why is that the case? Because we assume one Neumann ISA, right? Line by line by line by line. This allows you to go and debug your code. It would be super weird if you have exception that happened and you somehow finish future instructions, right? And it's also for interrupts, for interrupts. Let's say I type something on a keyboard, right? I type something on a keyboard during instruction n, n, n minus one, n minus two, n plus one, and n plus two, and then I type something here. What happened is it would retire n minus one, n minus two, and n, followed by handling whatever I'm typing. Then I can resume. I can resume instruction n plus one and n plus two. This allows easy recovery and easy method to restart my process, right? The question I'm gonna ask you is, how can we ensure this precise exception? Right? How can we ensure this precise exception? Hopefully by this point, you see the importance of having precise exception. You want to debug your code. You want to see the actual sequential change to the program, right? So uh, what I'm gonna tell you next is the naive idea on how to have precise exception. If we have instruction that take different amount of time to finish, it's hard to manage a uh, precise exception. So one thing we can do is make sure every single thing that you do, take the same amount of time. Loading the data from the main memory, 50 cycle, add also somehow 50 cycle, multiply 50 cycle. That is the downside because that makes the processor as slow as the slowest instruction. Even though you have a bunch of add, X, or logic operations, they are going to be as slow as loading data from the main memory. So that's bad. So we want to improve this further, right? So let's actually kind of like to, to design something, right? Uh, and this is basically would apply to whenever you have to program new things or when you have to work, uh, come up with a new project. The first thing you need to do, what is our goal? You need to be able to answer what's the goal of certain things you need to implement, right? So what's the goal of precise exception? Can someone tell me what's the goal of precise exception? Basically, the reason why we want to find a goal is to figure out what has to be implemented to reach that goal, right? So the goal of precise exception, now that no one answered anything, is we need to maintain sequential state of my instruction, right? The reason behind that is because you want to basically pause, like pause directly when exception happens. So generally, this is what we need to do. We need to be able to stop or style the execution right at the instruction that caught the exception. Previous instruction finish, future instruction either being squashed or style. Right? You need to be to break, stop the future instruction from happening. So let's assume this is our goal. We are going to now talk about the techniques that be used to maintain the sequential state. So let's go back to the uh, the lecture, even before the pipelining lecture, when we talk about the ISA, when we talk about the ISA, what does the programmer actually see? Because the goal is again, maintain sequential state. So the programmer only see what happened in the right back, right? That's what the programmer see. So what does it mean? If you want to maintain sequential state, and we know that, hey, the programmer only see what happened in right back. Where is the point that I need to apply this 
requirement that I need sequential state. Should I apply that in the fetch? Should I apply that in decode? Should I apply that in execute? Should I apply that in memory or should I just apply it in a write back stage? So that's my question. Which one should I apply the requirement on? Anyone still here? You can take a stab. I just want some response. <laughs> See, you all are alive. Yeah, so the question is, the goal is we want to maintain sequential state for the programmer, right? Programmer wants to see execution that happened line by line. Our observation is, hey, I mean, the programmer never see what happened in the pipeline. They only see what happened after the write back, right? After the write back. That's the only point programmer see. The rest, they cannot see anything. So our trick here, to make to to actually get the most performance we only need to maintain sequential state for the write back because we don't care about the rest right everything else can be done in any order you just have to make sure you retire basically once you write back we call that you retire the instruction so you want to actually retire instructions right in sequential order right that's it that's the only thing you can do i mean that's, that's the only requirement that you have to conform to for the programmer to see sequential state everything else can be done in any order right any order for example if I have an add, another add, I have a load, subtract, and then add, right? This is instruction one, instruction two, instruction three, instruction four, and instruction five, right? What I'm saying here is throughout the pipeline, throughout the pipeline, I can do something like this. I'm gonna run one, followed by three, followed by two, followed by four, followed by five, right? As long as they are independent instruction, I can do them in any order. But in the right back, in the right back, I just need to make sure that they're finished in this order. One, two, three, four, and five, right? In this particular example, what instruction out of all these five instructions is likely to take longer? Add, subtract, or load. So which, which one that you might expect that out of these five instructions can take a longer time? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So instruction number three can take longer. So what we can do is basically fetch one two three four five inside the decode inside the execute you're gonna do one two three and then instruction three gets stuck in the memory stage for a long time while it's doing instruction three you basically finish four and five make them wait in the right back stage once three finish in the right back would we'll do three four and five but you can do execute you basically you can execute four execute five and just have them wait in the right back, right? So the key here is throughout your pipeline, which can be any number of stage, right? It can be five stage pipeline, which is what we're doing right now. In the modern processor, you are looking at 30, 40 stages. That can be done in any order, except for the last stage. 
you have a buffer you have a buffer that reorder your instructions so that it's going one two three four five basically we are cheating the order of how you execute the instruction as long as the programmer don't see that we are good i was gonna say it's basically we just need to retire the instruction in sequential order the rest we can do whatever we want programmer never see that so are we all agree with that assumption any questions so far basically if you have question now it's the time to ask because yes we, we will we will then start proceeding on to what is the benefit of reordering and how to reorder any questions so far Uh, yeah, sure. Basically, let me put it this way. Let's say add take one cycle. This is one cycle. This is 10 cycle, one cycle and one cycle. If I do this in order, how many cycles this would take? Basically, the order that you have to do this is finish the add, finish the add, finish the low, then finish the subtract and add, right? Then in here, because subtract and add is fast, right? Why don't you just finish the add, finish the add while you're waiting for the load? You also then do subtract and then add, right? Basically run this out of order, out of order, as long as the write back happened in order, the programmer didn't even notice the difference. Is it like an overhead of synchronization? The write back stage become the synchronization point. We need to make sure that's done in order. So that's our synchronization point. The rest can be done in any order. So do you, do you get a better picture now? Basically, what's the benefit of doing this? Okay, awesome. So that's our goal. We want to reorder and then write back. So the structure that we call, so this is a, the name, reorder buffer. What is a buffer? I, I, I asked the same question again, uh, uh, I think back two weeks ago, what's the buffer? The place we store some intermediate values, right? Reordering means that we're gonna order, we're gonna sort things. So this buffer is used to sort instruction in the order of their arrival. So our idea is, well, you can complete everything inside your pipeline that can be done in any single order. But before we, before we make it visible to the programmer, we have this buffer and we reorder them. Right? We reorder them at the end so the programmer never noticed what happened inside the hardware. But somehow it's faster. So this is how you can do it. General idea is when you decode an instruction, you know what type of instruction it is. You then reserve an entry. I'm going to then tell you what is what does the ROB look like, but you reserve the entry inside the reorder buffer. When the instruction complete, write the result to reorder buffer. So you know, hey, that's our result. Then for the oldest instruction in the ROB, reorder buffer, you complete them. You complete them in order. Because you decode in order, this is already sorted. So you can write the results whenever the results are available. You you basically retire that instruction. And that's when your results become available to the programmer. So here is the uh, example. Let's say you want to do an add, right? R0, R1 plus R2. Basically, I'm gonna write it this way so that it's R1 plus R2. You write the result to R0, subtract, R10 from R0 and R2. 
So this is going into this. Multiply R4, R5, and R6. Notice there's a dependency right here, right? And then, I don't know, XOR, uh, 7, uh, 5, and R6. So the last two instructions have no dependency whatsoever. The reorder buffer would have this information. Basically, you would have something like instruction, right? The add, subtract, multiply, and XOR. The destination and the value. And then one more thing, which is the valid bit, right? So what will be the destination for the add? What's the destination for my add instruction from this example? Is RD, what's RD? Sorry for my handwriting, it's R0, right? <laughs> And then what is the definition for subtract? R10, right? And this is R4, and this is R4, right? Once the add is done, once the add is done, basically, this is during the decode stage. I'm going to allocate this entry. Not Nothing here is valid. I haven't really like run and finished everything here. So I don't know the value. The valid bit becomes zero because this is not valid. I don't have a result yet. I can even mark instruction as A, B, C, and D. So when I finish instruction A, and let's say the value is basically R1 plus R2, right? The valid bit becomes one. All right, give me a second, someone call me. Let me check there's something important. All right, uh, so now that I finished the add, that value becomes valid, right? When this is valid, it means that the subtract can run it. But before that, before even that, while subtract is waiting for the result of my add, I can do the multiply, right? This is basically R5 multiplied by R6, and this will become valid before the subtract because subtract is still waiting for an add. And let's assume the XOR can be done before this as well. So this is R5, XOR, R6. This becomes valid. So while I'm still waiting for the result of the subtract, while I'm still waiting for the result for subtract, I have the value for R4, right? You see this? I have the value for R4 already. So if future instruction need R4, you can go ahead and run it. For example, you have one more add instruction that say R5, R4, R10. This instruction E, the add, which write to R5. Basically, you can use R4 from here. So this is R4 plus R10, and this can become valid. This means that this structure, this buffer store, basically store what are the results of our instruction. And then, oh, God damn it, they call me again. Uh, let me double check.
All right, I'm back. So uh, basically, this allows you to keep running future instructions if you have the value available. And this structure, so when I can tell I can get rid of A, when I can tell I can get rid of this instruction. So you have the register files right here. When I can tell, I can get rid of A. Right, there are when A is done. Yes. When A is done, it then notice that, hey, A is the oldest instruction. The valid bit becomes one. So what I do here is I know that this is supposed to write to R0. I'm going to write R1 plus R2 right here. This is the result go in here. That's my results. I commit the change to the register files. Programmer see only the register files. These thing, this is visible to programmer. These thing are not visible to the programmer. So whatever we do in the reorder buffer, programmer don't see that. But future instructions see it, so you can use it right away. Programmer only the oh okay, the first add is done. That's the value of R zero. When is the next time I can retire? When B is done, right? When B is done, I'm gonna flip this to one, and I'm gonna write the value here. This value would go into R ten. And you write the value right here. Then I notice, okay, C is also done. It's done a long time ago. So I'm going to write R4 with R5 multiplied by R6. I'm going to then get rid of this thing because I finish. I'm going to get rid of that. So I have the buffer for future instructions, right? I would have now the buffer for future instructions. I use this buffer structure to keep track keep track of these are all the ongoing instructions if i have any partial data you can use it right now if you don't have partial data then i'm going to wait for that the ordered instruction whenever that's done i'm going to kick it out i'm going to kick it out i'm going to write the value to register files so here is what goes into the reorder buffer right so our question is well we have this structure what do what do we have to store valid bit can i use the data Destination register ID, destination register value. So these are for compute instruction, right? So whatever that has to do with register, basically. What about load and store? You need to put in the store address and store value. <clears throat> if you are loading into the register, then you need the ID, right? If you are storing some value, then you need the store address and store value. That you need instruction type so you know what type of instruction you're dealing with then you can actually break it down to different instruction type those are like fine grain optimization we are not going to talk about this in this class just be aware that the way you implement the reorder buffer can vary based on your design so with this it means that your register value that you are reading that you're reading after the decoder can come from three source, right? Three source, register files, the forward part, or the, the, the data forwarding part, the reorder buffer. So how can we tell which one should be used? So you see the problem here? So let's say you want to do add, right? R0, R1, and R2. And you say, hey, I need R2, right? And then I need R1. R2 can come from three path. Register files, the data forwarding, and also the reorder buffer. There are three things that 
can provide you the data. Three things that can provide you the data. Uh, so the solution is this. Solution is, well, because there are three sources. You first check the register files. You add the valid bit to the register files. If the valid bit is one, it means that use that data. No, no instruction in the pipeline is generating anything for that register value. That value becomes valid. Use the whatever value is in the register files. If this is not valid, if this is not valid, then check right. Check the destination ID of the reorder buffer that contains the value of that register. Then you access the reorder buffer, which means that you provide a mapping of register ID right to the entry in reorder buffer. To the entry in reorder buffer. So here's an uh, the old example, right? Uh, what was that? Add. Uh, uh, zero. Let me come up with an example, right? Subtract. So there's dependency right here. And then there's a multiply. Right? So this is using R0 to R6. I'm going to draw my register files, right? Rec file. This is the ID, this is the value, this is the valid bit. Initially, everything is valid. Uh, 0, uh, 1, uh, 2, uh, 3, uh, 4, uh, 5, and R6. Everything is valid. One, 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 right? And let's assume that R zero has a value zero. This one, two, three, four, five, six. For the sake of minimize uh, insanity of this example, this is what happened when I have the add instruction. This is a reorder buffer. I have three instructions, so I'm going to only draw three things. So this is the add, right? What is the register ID? What is the register ID for the destination of add? That's R0, right? Subtract, that's R3. D multiply, that's R4. When I have the add instruction, what I do here is I'm going to cross off this value because I know that some, something is going to write to uh, R0. The valid bit over here becomes 0. I'm going to label this A, B, and C. Over here, you will say this corresponds to reorder buffer entry A. Right? Entry A, so that you, you can tell that, hey, if you need R0, go get it from here. The value is still unknown, it's not valid. I'm still running them. It, when I have to subtract, when I have to subtract, you can't even start it because you need R0, right? When you look at R0, it's like, okay, I need to look at the value of A. You look here, it's not valid. So I don't run the subtract yet. I put them in the reorder buffer and then I move on. Then I move on to put in the multiply. Then I put in the multiply. I put in R4 right here. I see, okay, uh, it need R5 and R6. So I check out these two value, right? R5 and R6 are both valid. I put the multiply in the execute stage. I'm still running it, so I don't know the value. What do I do with R4 in the register file? What do I do right here? What do I put in? 
C because you know that R4. If whoever need R4, go look it from entry C in the reorder buffer because the value right here is not valid. Entry C is trying to get that value for you. Let's say for some magical reason, multiply finish first. So you're going to have the value here. What is R5 multiplied by R6? That's 30, right? And valid. So if you have future instruction that say, okay, I'm gonna do another multiply, uh, R5, R4, and then R, uh, R6. Basically, you're gonna need R4 and R6. Then you can go into entry C. You haven't retired yet because the multiply uh, is still waiting for the add to retire, right? Do you see why multiply cannot be retired? Because it's waiting for A. A is not done. But I have the value because this has become valid. So I can basically say, okay, I need R4. What is R4? This becomes 30. I know that R4 is 30 because we auto buffer already have that value. This instruction here, instruction D, right? I said this instruction D, what it does is it would start first, look here, look at R4 because I know I need R4. It would then also look at R6, right? Because it, what it does is multiply R4 and R6. So this is multiply to R5 and you need R4 and R6, right? Then you go and get R6, that's 6 from the register files. You try to get R4. Over here, you notice, oh, okay, the whatever value is in the register files is the old one. But the new value is in entry C. So I'm going to go look here. Then you check the valid bit. Oh, that's 1. So I can take that value right away because that's a valid value. So I'm going to take 30. And I'm going to put it here. So this becomes 30, this becomes 6, so you can start to do the multiply. Then, at some point in the future, our add is done. Right? Our, let's say our add is now done. What happened here is, I would then put this value, so what is uh, 1 plus R2, that's 3, right? It's 1 plus 2, becomes valid. I'm going to get rid of this because this is the oldest instruction. Because I got rid of it, I look at this entry, I know, okay, this is the register ID that I need to write the value to, R0. So you're going to look into R0, I'm going to use the green color now, right? You can look at R0 here, and you say, okay, the value should be valid now. I'm done, I'm retiring the instruction, this is valid. Then you can proceed on to do the subtract, right? This way, this way, the first benefit is you retire instruction, instruction in order, but your execution is done out of order. Any questions so far before we keep moving on? I know it might sound confusing, uh, so I, I want to take a quick break here, one to two minutes to, to, to take out the question so far before we move on. Any, any anyone have any questions? All right, no one is typing anything so far, so I assume that you all understand it or plan to rewatch this to and then ask me later. Either way works, but hopefully you kind of got the idea as of now. The green text. You retire things in order, everything else in the pipeline can be done in any order. So here's a problem. With the following code, what should be the value of R3 in each instruction? You have R3 right here. You use it again here. 
write it here, use it again here, and write it here. There are many versions of R3, right? Because this produce R3, this consume this version of R3, and then this produce R3 again. Then this consume the second version of R3, and now this produce the third version of R3. Anyone still remember the data dependency uh, slides that we have three types of dependency? What is the first dependency that we use in pipelining? What does raw dependency stand for? What is R? This is read as of right. Then there are two more types of dependency. Write after write and write after read. This is basically, oh no, not that one, my bad. This is write after write. This is right after read. If you do think out of order, you also have to deal with these two dependency. You need to deal with right after right and right after read. And to deal with that, basically you should have, each one of them should have its own version or its own name, right? This technique is called register renaming, register renaming. We already showed that uh, a little bit in the earlier slide when I showed the example, when I rename R0 to A and rename R4 to C. So if you rename the instruction inside the, the register ID with the ROB entry, so this is the key, right? You put the ROB entry that holds the latest register value, then, you know, right? You know that, okay, R0 is not valid. So you can look it from that particular entry in the ROP. And here is the example. I'm gonna show it again, right? Over here, you have R0. So you have add R0, R1, and R2, subtract R3, R0, R1. And you have to multiply R4, R5 and R6. So that's the, I think, almost exact same code that we see earlier. This is the ROB, right? So you have the add, uh, zero, and the ID is here. ID is A, B, C, and D, right? Uh, zero, the value is something, and it's not valid. This is the value. So in here, in the register file, right, to address the write after read and write after write, you just say R0, I don't know what it is yet, but if you want to know the value, go check entry A. Not valid. I don't have the value. Go check here. This is called register renaming. Basically, I don't know what's the value of R0 in the register files. Programmer, don't see the change yet. It's not valid. Go check that entry. If this becomes one, right? If that becomes one, you can use that value. So over here in R4, 
it would have entry C and not invalid because this thing multiply, right? Uh, for some value invalid, subtract uh, R3, some value invalid. So for R3 in the register files, what do I put here? What do I put in here? Which entry in the ROB produce the result for R3? Is it A? Is it B? Is it C or is it D? B. Yep. So you put in B here because if anyone else needs R3, go check entry B. What if I have another subtract? And then I say R3, R10, R11. So I'm going to have to subtract here. R3. If this happened, then it's still invalid, but I know the newest version of R3 is now what? I'm going to update to from B to what value? D. Yeah. So I'm going to put in D because future instruction that need R3, instead of looking at entry B, you look at now entry D. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Because if there's no question, I'm sure you still have questions. <laughs> so let's take a break until 1.10 uh, to gather the questions you have so we can address your questions. Because I feel like you're confused right now. Uh, how about this? Do you want me to keep this slide on or should I keep this one on? Otherwise, I'm going to keep this one on. Let's take a quick break. Uh, gather whatever uh consciousness did you have left if you need more go get coffee uh we will then go into uh out of order instruction afterward but we are kind of like halfway there already so if you have questions feel free to slowly type it and and kind of like phrase your questions i know that sometimes you're so confused that you're not even sure what to ask uh, hopefully, hopefully within this next 10 minutes, you have a little bit more clear picture of what you want to ask. Uh, so we'll meet again at 1.10. Is that okay? All right. So we'll be resuming this at one uh, one ten. Feel free to type in questions in, at any point in time. During the break, after the break, before the class is over, whatever. Just, just if you have questions that I can help, I'll answer. All right. See y'all in a bit.
All right, it's one ten. Are we all back? Uh, essentially, I'm gonna address uh, Champ question a little bit because that's a great question. So the question is, let's say we have from the, this example, right? For R three, we change from uh, B into D. And the question is, what if there's an instruction in the middle called, let's say, instruction X, come in and say, I need R3. But how can it correctly know that, okay, you need the R3 version that is from entry B, not entry D. By the time X come into the decode stage, what happened is during the time, during the time, R3 inside the register files is still holding the old value, which is B. So it would forward B as the source like, uh, correctly into X. So X would still have the, 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 the entry B in the pipeline. So we know that, okay, I'm going to wait for whatever, whenever B change the value from valid, uh, from invalid into valid, I'm going to get that value. So essentially, during that point in time, D doesn't exist yet. It would take correctly take B and forward B into the pipeline. Any other questions? Or oh, did I miss any questions? So Champ, do, do I, did I answer your question? Or do you still have any follow-up questions uh, afterward? Oh, uh, I'm not mute, but yeah, it's not mute. Okay, perfect. So one more thing uh, that we need to kind of cover to make sure everything here is correct because I have a talk about branch and we've been talking about branch prediction for almost two lectures. So one thing that you might have realize is what if there's a branch right what if there's a branch uh sorry not future for the rob basically when, whenever you have branch whenever you have a branch it means that your code can go into this part or this part right if or else basically what you do is you let's say you do branch prediction and you go into the if part to the left right here right Let's say you go here, you have ROB prime, the new version of ROB. What you need to do is to keep a copy of the old ROB. We call this checkpointing. Think of it as playing games. You need to fight your boss, the boss on the game, and the boss is your branch. You sometimes predict incorrectly, so the boss kill you, right? So what you do is you go to the save point, save the game, Go fight the boss, hopefully you beat it, but if you fail, then you load. Load that state, then fight the boss again, right? So these checkpoint copies are updated with the instruction that produce the correct register value. So up on branch misprediction, you store checkpoint version of the ROV, sorry, future file is essentially a, a more advanced structure. We are not going to talk about it. Uh, this is for the graduate level class. I'm going to discuss like how to design the different version of ROV. But what we learned here is generally the same thing, the correct thing. Basically, you go into checkpoint the ROV, try the branch prediction. If you predict correctly, yay, you keep going. If you predict incorrectly, then you move from here back to the state and now go to the else path. And that's it. Now that we talk about the reorder buffer, I'm there. Oh, then basically move on to the out of order execution. And I have a firm belief that uh, once you learn out of order execution and what we learned so far, things like branch prediction, uh, pipelining, super scalar architecture, uh, ISA, and all those trade off, coupled with the next set of material that you are going to learn that are related to the main memory you're pretty much ready to work in hardware design. I'm sure you can basically go and interview at uh, Intel or AMD 
And there's a pretty high chance that if you know the things we talked so far, they'll be happy with you as a candidate. Uh, that's how deep we are going about the right amount of like what most uh, top university uh, for for architecture uh, the, the program. So yeah, that that's where I, where I aiming this class for. So so if you know things like out of order execution, you know how DRAM works, you know how caching works, you know how virtual memory works. You're pretty much ready to go into system and architecture. Uh, in a in a top industry company for undergraduate position. So let's talk about out of order execution. Hopefully I motivate you into listening to what I'm gonna blabber about for the next uh, 30 minutes. And we you are almost there, right? What you learned so far is is really, really uh catching up to to I guess year around year 2000, 2005, right? So what we do so far is we read assembly files and we schedule them based on the order of arrival, right? And the introduction of the ROV, reorder buffer, uh, essentially allow you to run things not in order. So what we assume so far, software schedule all the instructions. Who are these software? Compiler? And the programmer, depending on how you write the program, right? And then the hardware just take the instruction and run them sequentially. My question is, if you have things like reorder buffer, why can't we schedule them? Because we know the fine grained information about the hardware. We know everything. We have the information of that adder hasn't been used, it's free. If you have an add instruction in the future, just send them there, right? Compiler has no idea about that. The hardware do. So the hardware can perform some scheduling, pick which instruction to forward into the pipeline. Then as long as we retire things in order, we're good. So this is called out of order instruction dispatch or sometimes out of order execution. This is a really, really, really common topic in architecture. It's used everywhere except for the GPU uh, and some accelerator, like basically a, 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 a chip design that's uh, targeting certain application. But in the CPU, you apply this technique. So what it does is, if you look at the instruction, there are dependent instruction. Dependent instruction means that you have instruction one that produce result for instruction two. But then there might be instruction three, instruction four that use a totally different source, right? It's not dependent on the result of instruction one. So what does this mean? It means that you run instruction one Instruction two, wait for instruction one to finish. In the meantime, you can run instruction three and four, right? You can run instruction three and four and there'll be no repercussion on the effects. No repercussion whatsoever, as long as we have in order write back. As long as the programmer see the correct version of my sequence of instruction, right? So the benefit, so what, what are the benefits here? A lot faster. Your, your computer would actually run a lot faster. You can correlate long instruction, things like load, right? Things like system call. These things are long, so you can just ignore them while you're running the rest of the instruction and hopefully eventually that load instruction come back, you can continue on, right? So these are the key components of what do we need to basically squeeze as much performance as possible. Uh, it would be something similar to the reorder buffer, but we use a different name and it's a different, a slightly different structure. These make the hardware simpler and it makes a lot your your thought about logic a little bit simpler. The first thing we add is what we call reservation station. 
the reservation station, the only purpose is whenever you fetch a new instruction, you put that new instruction in there. It's basically it's a buffer that acts like a window that say these are all the instruction I fetched so far. And then you can dispatch, basically send this instruction into the pipeline whenever the source are ready, whenever the operands, these are the source. Operand. Whenever the source are ready, you can schedule them. So sometimes we call this a scheduling window. Then you need any structure that helps reordering at the end. So this is uh, in the right back. Right. So you have the reorder buffer. Make sure instructions are commit in order at the end. This is sometimes called instruction window. It's the window that consists of all the instructions and you retire them in order. Anything else? If you rename your register files, I'm going to put like basically at the end of the day, I'm going to put everything together, but you can add this thing called register aliasing table or the rename table. Basically, it renames say R zero to instruction A, R one to instruction B. The reason why we add a separate table is you can then allow your own uh, register files that the programmer can see and separate it from these register aliasing table. You decouple this structure. You have the future version of the register files and then you have the programmer version of the register file. That's why we call it future files. So here is a structure of the reservation station, the one, the one that store, the one that store all the instruction. So this is what it does. When you fetch the instru instruction, whenever you fetch it, just put them in a reservation station. Put them in even when you have a stall pipeline. Just keep fetching. Throw throw new instruction into the uh, into the station. And it maintains all the active instruction. What are the operations? What are operands? When your source, when your source operand are ready, dispatch them. Put them in the pipeline. Any questions about how we deal with the reservation station? Again, I'm going to put everything together for you so you see the big picture. All right, so the next step is dealing with register renaming. So now that we have the reservation station that consists of the instruction, it consists of the instruction that you are going to finish. The register ID, the register ID is now renamed to the reservation station entry. We have the reservation station entry, basically this. The architecture register, this is basically what the programmer see. That is equal to things like R0, R1, R2. That's, that's a physical register. Then the information in the register rename table or register, yeah, register, register aliasing table, the structure that I say is different from the typical register files. You have the tag value and the valid bit. If the valid bit is one, it means that you can use the value. The tag is reservation station entry. These basically eliminate right after read or right after write. And then virtually enable the performance of having so many register, even though your ISA only have eight. You are going to build in this register aliasing table 
you have as many register as the number of reservation station entry. And here is the structure of reservation station. You have the instructions and you can add. You want to add R1 and R2 into R0. Then you want to say subtract R3, R4, and R0. So that's a dependency right here. And then let's say you want to do a multiply into R3 from R4 and R5. And then you can do multiply again. R4, R5, and R6. So this is a structure of your reservation station. Anyone have a question? Okay. And these are zero, R three, R four. That can change. Let's say you. This is the label A, B, C. Uh, I'm gonna. Okay, let, let me do a big picture, like basically a full-blown uh, example later. That's an algorithm. Sorry, if, if you turn on your microphone and you don't have a question, can you please turn it off? But if you have question, feel free to ask the question. All right, so there is an algorithm to tell what to do. And these are the steps. If you fetch something, if you fetch something, the first thing you do after fetch, put that instruction in the reservation station. If you have the reservation station entry, if it's available, you can put in new instruction. The new instruction of that, the new instruction and the source, the source is tag is inserted into the reservation station and you rename then you rename if the reservation station is full that's when you start the pipeline otherwise you're gonna keep fetching don't worry about the mic uh, uh i just want to make sure there's no question or if there's a question you should ask them uh if there's a if there is a entry in the reservation station Put the instruction in, then that's going to be a common data bus. Basically, these are wires that connect every part together. And whenever I finish my instruction, I'm going to yell out loud, who need R0? If you need R0, take this value because I'm done. Basically, what it does is, based on the tag that you put in, in the reservation station, if the tag match, Get the source value because someone finished computing that value for you. You go and get that value. When both source, basically when you can start running the instruction, you dispatch them into the execute unit. After you finish the instruction, you broadcast the task saying, who need R0 because I'm finishing compute R0. Then you update every single thing. So let me put everything together. Good. So let's assume this add take two cycle, multiply take three cycles, fetch decode and write back take one cycle. The processor has one adder, one multiplier, and you have a four stage pipeline. Fetch decode, execute and write back. Forget about memory, just let's forget about memory. And here's your code. You have the multiply R1, R2, and R3, add R4, R1, and R5, add R6, R3, and R7, uh, and then add again R8, R9, and R10, multiply R11, R6, and R8, blah, blah, blah. And here is the reservation station. And I actually don't have the a lot of room for the register aliasing table. That's why I don't draw it here. So I'm gonna erase first erase the tag that say reservation station. Let me just do it here. See if I can fit it in. And then on the top of this figure, I'm going to draw the register aliasing table. 
body add body multiply so there's a one for an adder and another one for the multiplier right over here what's the destination for the multiply is r1 right source is r2 and this is r3 what i do here is at the register a listing table i will have the tag i will have the value and then i will have the uh value bit i'm gonna tag it as say x the value is unknown because i don't know what it is yet it's not valid instead of r1 here i know that once i finish the multiply i will finish the tag right so the destination here oops. once r1 is done that's i'm gonna broadcast x right? and then i'm gonna write r1 as whatever value that becomes what's the source for the second add is R4, right? What is source one? What is source one? X, yep. Because R1 produced by the tag X, instead of putting an R1, you rename it to X because you know that once X finished, I can use that value. And then you put in R5 right here. Because X is not ready, I don't dispatch them. I don't dispatch them yet, right? So it stays there. What about the second ad? I mean, the, the, the third instruction, this is R6, right? This is going to be R3, and this is going to be R7, right? So over here, because I tag value and the valid bit, I'm going to start tag as A. The value is still unknown, not valid. R8, R9, and then R10 right here. Right? Tag B, not known, not valid. R11, what do I put here? And then what do I put here? So for source one, where do I get R6? is a and over here is what where they get i8 from b one thing that i haven't told you yet let's say this is your register files again sorry about how small this is i can't fit everything here but in the register file, we're going to have R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7, and R8, right? And blah, blah, blah. Basically, anything continue on from that point. Over here, when you have tag X to R1, let's say this is the value 0, you basically put an X here from the old example. Basically, you put X in here. The next time you need R1, you look at that entry, and you know, okay, I need X. Then R2, right now no one write to that. So let's say it's two, three, who write to four? Who write to four?
The answer is I actually did it wrong. So let me erase it. My bad. So when I do this instruction over here, right? I'm gonna use a different color. This will be green. When I'm at this instruction, I put an A value is not valid, right? R4 is A. Then over here, R6, you have B, zero and invalid here. R6, you put in B. And then when you add this instruction, right? When you add, add R8, R9, and R10, this is C. And you put in R8 as C. And over here is basically B and C. Essentially, that becomes B and C. In the last instruction is, oh, and then I forgot to do this because you have this instruction, right? Tag Y, question mark, question mark. And over here, R11 would become Y. Over here is R4, right? R4 and R4. Uh, R11. So what is R11? What is R11 here? This one, right? So it's Y. What is R4? What is R4? R4 is a right because if you look at r4 here is a and over here you overwrite to r4 so it's still r4 but now you go then erase this old r4 that becomes d right d zero unknown when you add this instruction uh which one <laughs> sorry there are so many entries in the table but here's what it is so when you said should it be a instead of r4 uh which one of the r4 you're talking about here Put that like five half four. Essentially, let me let me kind of rephrase it. Source one, all right, yeah, yeah, I refix it. Yep. Basically, source one and source two, you look at the register files. Register files look at this particular entry. When you finish, let's say you finish X. Let's say you finish x, this value becomes some certain value. Uh, let's say it's 10, and this becomes valid. What happened after that? What happened after this is, once you have x, you broadcast to everyone who needs x. Who needs x? The reservation station say, oh, I, I need x right here. I need x right here. So I'm going to overwrite x and put in 10. Register file say, oh, I need X as well, right here. I'm going to replace X with 10. Now this is done, I can then dispatch, right? I can now dispatch this instruction because I have all the source. And you can do this gradually to make sure everything is done in order as in terms of the write back, but the rest the rest, whenever you have the value, for example, here and here, you can put them in the pipeline right away to make sure you write the results of R6 and R8 as soon as possible. So the benefit is essentially, if you look at the data flow model, these imitate data flow. If I have all the inputs, I run it right away. I don't care about the order as long as I have all the input. As long as I have all the input, I'm going to execute my code. The restricted parts are what? What can prevent 
the effectiveness of my out of order execution. So how many instructions you can fetch until you have to stall the fetch unit? That's one thing, right? The size of your reservation station can be a limiting factor. How you write the code, how much dependency between each instruction can, can also limit your performance. If you have so many dependent instructions, then your code would run slower because you can't put a lot of instruction into the pipeline at the same time. If you have a lot of independent instructions, then you can. One more thing. We haven't talked about what we plan to talk about in the second part of the lecture. So out of order with memory, uh, we are not going to cover this on the exam, but be aware that when you have to deal with the memory, there's a dependency between the load instruction and the store instruction, right? And you need to detect the dependency. And the question is, how can how are we going to treat this load instruction is something you have to decide, right? You can always wait. But you can also forward the store data to a load, right? Let's say you have a load and store queue and you load something that you just store so you can forward it right away. You don't have to get it from main memory. We are not talking about this for the purpose of the exam. Afterward, afterward, once we are back, we, uh, basically we resume from this point on, we will start talking about what happened when you have to deal with memory. That's the obvious part, and that's the not so obvious part. And you can also combine different queue. And there's a structure called load store unit, which uh, allow you to do out of order for load and store. Again, I'm not gonna talk about it now for the interest of time and for your sanity, because it's already a lot of things, right? And let me skip to the end of the lecture here. That is an exercise, again, because there's limited time, uh, I will show briefly, show what I'm talking about here. It's a real uh, question that I had from last year's class uh, for architecture. This is a little bit too advanced for your undergraduate level, but I'm going to go through this question because once we go through this question together, a lot of things becomes clear. A lot of the, how does out of order execution work will become a lot more clear. We will do this next Monday. We will do this next Monday. Uh, I'm gonna post the question on Canvas today after the class. You can take a look at the question. I will go through this on Monday for the in-class exercise. So what is going to happen on Monday? Let me go over that briefly. Uh, first of all, once your uh, deadline for assignment one pass, I'm going to post assignment two right away. Your assignment two will basically involve pipelining. Again, there'll be checkpoint. I will tell you exactly what I expect from the checkpoint. Again, uh, I will specify how many points is worth for the checkpoint. And then second assignment will be, will contain extra credit as well. What I want you to implement is pipelining without data forwarding. But if you want to try on your own, you can do with data forwarding. The one with data forwarding is the extra credit. Uh, you will build from your own code in assignment one. So I encourage you to finish assignment one. Otherwise, you're going to get double whammy. Basically, you're going to get penalized twice for assignment one and then for assignment two. Assignment three, you will get a fresh code from me. There will be a new starter code that already have pipelining and everything. And then you're going to, going to implement branch predictor and caching. Uh, that's all for the assignments part. 
for the next lecture. Uh, this is essentially the end of what we are expecting for your uh, midterm exam, which based on our poll is on October 14th, next Wednesday. So I, after I post this exercise, please feel free to look at those. Uh, I will make sure the exam, oh, actually, have we talked about the format of the exam? I can't, I, I think I forgot about that. I think we already talked about the date, right? Did we talk about the format of the exam? Yes, no. All right. There are two choices. Oops, somehow I start with choice number two. <laughs> Again, obviously, you have a 24 hour take home exam or online three hours. Obviously, one will be a longer exam, two will be a shorter exam. Everything is open book, open internet. Which one do you want? One or two? So that's one word for two. Who else? The one word for one. Okay, now is. So far, there's one word for option one, one word for option two, and it ever. Oh, okay. So if it's equal, okay, one more word for option one. So you have two words now. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Nine, eight, seven. Okay, I think, I think option one wins. So we'll do a take home exam, three hours. I mean, no, take home exam, 24 hours. It will be slightly longer than online. Uh, you should, I'm not going to expect you to waste more than three hours on the exam. So if I cannot finish everything in 45 minutes, I'm going to make the exam shorter. That's how I would gauge it basically because, because I, I create the exam, I should be able to write out the answer in 45 minutes. You are in your case, if you know what you're doing, maybe one or one and a half hour or two hours. If you need to kind of look up the lecture slides, uh, refresh something, look at the video, depending on how long you go over the video. Hopefully within three hours. All right, so that's it for the discussion on the exam. Take home 24 hours. No coding. Unless you want coding in assembly, but I kind of don't want that. So yeah, so no coding. There might be an open end design question for fun. <laughs> I hope this is more fun for you because the way I grade these open end questions is I typically go really lenient as long as it's within the human conceivable logic. So I, I basically, this question, I want you to, to think about, okay, if I do certain things, how would I design my ship? Uh, again, take home 24 hours. Uh, I think that's all I want to talk about today. We ran out of time to go through the example. <coughs> Sorry. Next Monday, it will be a review session. Oh, actually, one more thing. Let me check my calendar. I, I, I think I put in the makeup, makeup class on Friday. Let's see. Yeah, so I forgot to mention that. Let me make one more slide.
So there is going to be a makeup class at 2 p.m. on Friday. Uh, I will post. Whoops. I know that not everyone has a free slot over there, so I'm gonna post the video right away. And this is essentially Q and A because we are done with the content of the first half of the class. So we Q and A. It will be going over in class exercise that you have questions. It will be basically pretty much student driven. So that will be basically a video on like these are the topics we cover so far. Any questions? How about the in class exercise? If you're done, we're done. Uh, if you have questions or assignments, I'm happy to answer all those things as well. As well. And then on the on the October twelfth class, the one on Monday, we will go over some sample questions. So sometime during this weekend, I'll post some sample questions. You can take a look at those. We will go over that on Monday. Is that a good plan? Basically kind of like three hours-ish review uh, on the, all the material we've seen so far. The reason why I have a longer review is I, I feel like this is so different from the typical computer science classes that you learned so far. It's a lot of new material. It's a lot of new way to think about the program. It's a lot of new way to think about, hey, hardware is not the God that you cannot change anymore. Sometimes hardware sucks and we need to change it. And we do change it all the time, right? So, so hopefully with this class, you change the mindset about hardware as a super solid thing into, hey, if I need to change the hardware, maybe I should ping like, folks at Intel or AMD and say, hey, this would be really useful, cool piece of hardware to have on the ship, right? Your iPhone change the hardware all the time, every single generation. I am sure the next one, I, I, I think they're going to be announcing it soon. Uh, we'll also have a different way to manage the processor, too, right? To save power, to make it faster. So, so hopefully you change that mindset. And that's all for the class today. Sorry, I'm babbling toward the end. Makeup class Friday, 2 p.m. Class on Monday for both of them, our review session. But the one on Monday, we'll go over potential sample questions that you might see on the exam. All right? So that's it for the class today. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying so far. If you have any feedback whatsoever, please, please.